Last week, we learned about how sacred music developed from Gregorian chant in the 9th century to glorious four-part polyphony and how music flourished under Elizabeth I's church. All of this would soon come to an end. During the period from 1649 to 1660, the political structure of England shifted to a republic instead of a monarchy, and the English Commonwealth was formed. The political shift put Puritans in control. The Puritans indeed had honorable and noble intentions, and their expression of faith is no less valid, but it directly contrasts Anglicanism. The Puritans rejected any ritual practice that was not reflected in Holy Scripture. So, in the Puritan church, there was no celebration of the saints. One would not venerate the Blessed Mother. She might get a nod around Advent and Christmas, but that's about it. And there was a stifling emphasis on sin and penitence. To the Puritans, feasts like Christmas and Easter were not occasions to be celebrated with a festive dinner, but rather in devout prayer all hours of the day. Since the Puritans held political power, many aspects of Anglicanism were punishable by imprisonment. They outlawed use and ownership of the Book of Common Prayer. They removed church organs in addition to candles, paintings, statues of saints, crucifixes, etc. Church music was mostly prohibited except for the singing of psalms and occasional hymns accompanied by a village band. Our beautiful tradition of sacred choral music had practically disappeared. As a matter of fact, they even outlawed singing Christmas carols and performing Christmas pageants. This ban lasted until the English monarchy was restored in 1660. Thankfully, Charles II came to the rescue. Cathedral services resumed, choirs were reinstated, and we had business as usual. Let's fast forward 200 years. We are now in the early 19th century. By this time, liturgy had become low, and I mean snake belly low. The Anglican Church had drifted far from its Catholic and apostolic origin. There was a general decline of sacramental life within the Anglican Church. Clergy were lax, ritual observance was neglected, rubrics ignored, there was little regard for the prayer book and this glorious tradition of music that had once flourished. Church music had reached a state of stagnation. Singing was limited to metrical psalms and a few hymns. The old forms of music that had been defined by the English Reformation had fallen out of the repertoire. Well, for every thesis, there's an antithesis. There was a group of clergy and intellectuals in Oxford, most notable amongst whom were Edward Pusey, John Henry Newman, and John Keeble. They set out to recall the church's Catholic and apostolic origin, and to that end published 90 tracts. The topics of these publications included the necessity for frequent observance of Holy Communion, the rites and customs of the church, holy days observed in the English church, etc. The most influential of all of these tracts is in fact the last one, Tract 90, wherein Newman argues that the 39 Articles of Faith, which you can read in your prayer book, are actually consistent with Catholic doctrine, and therefore Catholicism is an aspect of our heritage that should be celebrated, not rejected. The publication of these tracts spawned a movement in the church, which we now refer to as the Oxford Movement, or Catholic Revival, and paved the way for Anglo-Catholic churchmanship. The Oxford Movement encouraged a recovery of the beauty of the church's worship in the external forms of liturgical ceremonies, vestments, and music. A common criticism of this movement is that high church is perceived as pompous and precious, suitable only for the elite. The intention, however, was just the opposite. The chanting, the incense, and the glorious choral music was to convey a feeling of hope to the oppressed and the poor. The highly ritualized ceremonies and music were to help common people feel like important participants in an important act. For Anglo-Catholics, it's not a fussy aesthetic. It's an elevated importance of sacramental theology 
and presence of symbols in our worship through which we are made aware of our obligation to live in accordance with that which is symbolized. It's a conviction that a beautiful and transcendent experience can inspire people to continue the worship outside the church by caring for the poor, the sick, and the outcast. As a result of this movement, there was a renewed practice of choral evensong and choral Eucharist in parish churches. That's when the choir sings the ordinary of the Mass on behalf of the faithful. With the resurgence of this practice, simply reviving 16th and 17th century music was not enough, and new music was needed. There was a huge and sudden outpouring of new choral music, psalm settings, canticles, and hymnody, much of which has become standards in our repertoire today. Samuel Sebastian Wesley, John Goss, John Stanner, Charles Village Stanford, and Charles Hubert Hastings Perry are amongst the most notable composers from this time. Our choir, in particular, is well acquainted with the works of all of these composers. Here's a well-beloved setting of the Te Deum by Stanford. In the first half of the 19th century, 150 new hymnals were published in England alone. In 1859, a committee was formed to select hymns of the highest caliber and universality from these various hymnals and publish them into one book. That book was Hymns Ancient and Modern, which is one of the most beloved hymnals in our history. It consists of 132 hymns of Latin origin, 131 of English, and a whopping grand total of 10 from Germany. Compare that to a Lutheran hymnal, which will be replete with hymns by Bach, Luther, etc. The publication and distribution of this hymnal paved the way for a rich ecumenical mix of hymns, which is reflected in most subsequent hymnal publications, including our own Hymnal 1982. Church music continued to flourish well into the 20th century. From this period, we have a host of important composers, including John Ireland, Edward Elgar, who was a Roman Catholic, but his music is so full of Anglican sentimentality that we have a home for him in our liturgy. Rafe von Williams, Herbert Howells, and William Walton, Benjamin Britten, to name a few. Here's a setting of the evening service Collegium Regal by Herbert Howells.
That's where I'll leave you today. Stay tuned for part three next week, where we'll learn about how the electric guitar ruined absolutely everything. That's all for now. Stay healthy, stay safe, and God bless.